Sure. Um, first of all, I want to thank Melissa and the whole Share Shred team because we love collaborating with you. Um, we are so impressed and inspired by the work that Share Shred does. And um, the topics you choose are so interesting. The way you uh, present things is so accessible. Your speakers are amazing. So the fact that we get to partner with you is really a privilege. Um, we all have the same goal and it's wonderful to meet other people who are working to further that goal. As you know, woman to woman um, is the goal is to provide support to women with gynecologic cancer and their families, however we possibly can, through education, through resources, through financial assistance. Uh, Share Shirt's mission is a bit broader um, because it's not just gynecologic cancer, it's also women with gynecologic and breast cancer. Um, and we are just, again, it's an honor to be part of this event. And thank you all for being here. You know, I know that Zoom you know, is getting tougher and tougher as, as uh, the time goes on. So thank you for taking the time to be here. We do hope that um, Dr. Samantha Cohen, gynecologic oncologist in Mount Sinai, will be joining us at some point to say a brief hello to all of you. Some of you might be her patients and um, she's just currently with patients and she will pop in when she has a moment. So looking forward to that. And I will turn it over to you, Melissa. First of all, oh, she's here right now. Maybe she's gonna start. First of all, as she's logging on, I just want to say that we feel the exact same way. We love our partnership with Mount Sinai in general and women, to, woman to woman in particular, and, and we are equally impressed. Before Today's topic is dignity and the cancer experience, um, but I do know that Dr. Cohn wanted to say a few words, and she is simply connecting to audio as we speak, so... Oh, there she is. Okay. Dr. Cohn, thank you so much for joining us. We were just about to get started. So we're going to take a pause. We'd love for you to share a few words before we start. Hi, good morning. Thanks for letting me join you. Um, I just wanted to uh, wish everybody a healthy and happy new year for everyone. And um, why don't you get started with you know, sort of the topic at hand, and then I can jump in. I can stay on for a few minutes. Wonderful. Feel free to add whenever you have a thought you'd like to share. Okay, so, great. So much, yes. Yeah, we just, we really appreciate it. I was just explaining, um, Dr. Cohen, before you jumped on, that you're having a busy patient morning. So we really appreciate you coming for as long as you're able to stay. So thank you so much. Sure, thank you. So as Rachel said, my name is Melissa Rosen and I am the Director of Training and Education at Charsheret. I want you to know that I am also a two-time cancer survivor, um, both um, lymphoma and breast cancer. And so although I have been in, in nonprofit education for many, many years, this is a particularly personal mission for me. Um, and so my, what I share comes from two perspectives. And, and I want to thank you particularly for joining us today because this is an all too absent conversation within the cancer world. In fact, um, when I started speaking about this topic, I did a Google search to start because, you know, I'm always looking for great information and resources. You know how Google, when you do a search, auto-populates what it thinks you might want to be taught, you know, researching? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The few entries that were there were something about a corporation called Dignity Health. There was nothing about dignity and illness. Um, and when Google can't provide answers, you know that's a conversation that's not being had. You know, Cancer is an all-encompassing experience. When someone is diagnosed, it's all about the details, right? Appointments, screenings, calls to insurance. It's all about dealing with and treating the cancer itself. It sometimes can feel like everything else is falling to the bottom because, right, we're really literally in a, in a fight for survival. The cancer experience is a physical one. There's no doubt about it. Yet we have to acknowledge that there are psychosocial aspects. There's a strong emotional component. And for many, there's also a spiritual component. The primary goal during treatment is physical healing from cancer. 
but it's important to understand that complete healing doesn't happen without addressing the emotional complications that cancer can bring. And certain cancer diagnoses may actually impact our identities more than others. Breast cancer, ovarian cancer, other gynecological cancers impact body parts that are tied societally and perhaps biologically to our identities as women and even to our sexuality. You know, cancer treatment that requires an os an ostomy bag is a co is a, a good example of a constant reminder of the change to our basic bodily functions. When we lose parts that are internal or that, um, that don't change the way we physically function, that it, it may not be quite as obvious physically, but it is still working on our emotions behind the scenes. Breast cancer and these other cancers, they impact our self-esteem in different and unique ways than many other cancers do. Cancer treatment can often lead to the feeling and maybe even sometimes the reality of a loss of control, right? Practically, while we're in treatment, we often lose our ability to schedule our own days. We can also feel loss of control about bigger issues, dating, fertility, career, and of course, mortality. So how do these emotional concerns impact dignity? Well, a good part of dignity is about self-determination and cancer can not only rob us of self-determination on a daily basis, but can make our future decisions feel more limited than we anticipated. Dignity is also about the ability to present ourselves as we see ourselves. And as I mentioned briefly, cancer changes our bodies from treatment-related hair loss to the loss of body parts. For example, as I mentioned earlier, breasts or ovaries. Some of these changes are temporary and others are permanent. In either case, it is a physical announcement of illness to others and a reminder to ourselves of the changes that cancer can bring. So the question is, how can those in treatment and survivors or thrivers maintain a solid sense of dignity in the face of cancer. Well, the good news is there are many things we can do. Uh, okay, so Esther says that the sound is coming in and out. Are other people having that problem? No. Okay, so I'm, if I'm not hearing anybody else is having that problem, I'm hoping it resolves on your end, but this will be recorded and posted on the Sharsharit, um, on the Shar Sharet website and maybe woman to woman will be sending it out as well. Okay, so how can we, those in treatment or those who are survivors, drivers, maintain that sense of dignity? And I was saying, the good news is we wouldn't be here unless there were things you could do. So um, of course it doesn't change the diagnosis, but what it does is change the way we deal with our diagnoses. And if you're wondering why attitudes matter so much, I wanna share something that might seem counterintuitive to you. Study after study has shown that patients whose non-medical needs are met and non-medical concerns are addressed have better medical outcomes. That means they may get through treatment with fewer complications. They not only thrive in greater, uh, survive in greater numbers, but thrive. So you can see the importance of doing whatever we can to maintain our dignity during our cancer experience. And there are two ways. Yeah, Dr. Cohn. Oh, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to jump in. Maybe you're gonna talk about this, but I was just thinking as you're speaking, um, a couple things that I've, noticed and my patients have told me and we've sort of experienced together over the past couple of years is this you know this sort of feeling of loss of dignity this overwhelming um sort of the whole situation being completely overwhelming has just been compounded by the covid crisis and it's put a stress you know sort of this extra layer of stress on all of our patients and all of the healthcare professionals. And patients really feel that, you know, my patients, we talk about this all the time. 
Um, but I think I mentioned this the last time we spoke. So for some of my patients going through, you know, what they're going through, they're well supported by, you know, you're well supported by your families. Um, so you don't necessarily think that you could benefit from all of the resources that we have, including our amazing social work team, um, our palliative care supportive oncology services. And so people don't, you know, patients don't always sort of verbalize or talk to us about what they're going through because they have supportive families and they have supportive home environments or you have supportive, you know, people helping you at home. But the truth is that everybody can benefit from that. And it's really meant for everybody. And, you know, supportive oncology has like this history of being sort of doom and gloom, but it's not. It's all about how can we help you with the emotional impact, the pain that you're going through, all of the side effects, and help you get through it, you know, into remission, into the future. It, that's what supportive oncology is really about. But people have sort of a negative um, impression of it because it used to be different. And I think that, you know, there's sort of this disconnect in that regard. I, I, I love that message. It is very true. Very often at Charcheret, um, we'll hear from people who are involved as volunteers many years after their experience. And they say, I, I wish I had thought to call while I was going through it. I assumed it was for people who had less support than I did or less resources than I did. And that's just not true. You know, we often say, to people going through it. You don't even need to, like, you know, at, that we meet in the community at events and things. You don't need to know what you need. Call us. We'll help right. you figure it out. And, and that is true for the amazing resources that Mount Sinai and Woman to Woman have. That is true for the resources at Shar Sheret. And, and it's so important. It really is. Um, it's not just like you said, about doom and gloom. It's about living well alongside cancer. Exactly. And along, you know, and after the cancer treatment is finished, you could still use the, you know, people, unfortunately, patients sometimes have long lasting side effects of all the treatments that we've given. And that's what, you know, supportive oncology is about. And I would include in, in everybody's probably some of the um, people are on this call know this better than any of us that some of the procedures that we do as prophylactic procedures, um, not to treat cancer, to, to prevent cancer, also have, you know, ne unfortunately negative side effects. And this relates to, you know, a sense of loss of dignity, loss of, you know, hormones, loss of a sense of well being. And, you know, these are all very important um, issues to discuss and to try to tackle. You don't, you know, it doesn't have to be from a cancer treatment. It could be from a preventative treatment that, you know, unfortunately has some negative um, side effects emotionally and otherwise. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned how COVID impacts, you know, one of the things that I've always struggled with and my doctor laughs at me is I'll call and say, I don't know if this is a symptom or if I'm just getting old. So now people say, I don't know if this is a symptom. I don't know if I'm getting of concern, if I'm getting old, if it's COVID related, like, please help me sort this out. And, you know, and the healthcare teams are there for that too. Dr. Cohn, thank you for bringing such an important um, perspective to it. That, that was great. Thank um, you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, um, like I said, there were two ways that you can reclaim some of the dignity that the cancer experience may take away about. The first is demanding respect from our healthcare providers and the team around us. And the second is what we can do for ourselves, how we present ourselves, be kind to ourselves, continue with purpose. So let's, let's start with respect. When we enter the world of oncology, it can feel overwhelming, isolating, frightening, and it's a common occurrence to defer to our doctors. 
sometimes even when we don't understand what we're being told, even when we know a decision may not be right for us, because after all, they are the experts and they are there to save our lives. But I want to remind everybody that it's important to play an active role in our treatment and our recovery. I, I want to be clear before I continue. I'm not saying to ignore medical advice or guidance. I am not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that um, even a doctor's, you know, worst nightmare is having somebody nod and nod and then walk out and say, I didn't understand a word of that, or that's not going to work. They want you, your healthcare team wants you to be an active part of your, your treatment. So that includes choosing members of our treatment team where possible, choosing doctors that listen to our concerns and our needs, who create treatment plans and survivorship goals that are geared to our specific diagnosis and our specific personal priorities. I'm saying that you should be comfortable sharing your questions and concerns with your team. You should be comfortable seeking out a second or even third opinion if you're not, if you're not comfortable or, or sure about an original plan. Your doctors and your team members, treatment team members, want to hear your thoughts as part of the process. And that's important, and that's part of self-determination. You know, a doctor may, or someone who's part of your treatment team, may not know that you have a particular concern, whether that concern is fertility preservation or that concern is being well enough to um, attend a family, a family celebration at a certain time in your treatment, whatever it is, all of those needs, all of those concerns should be shared. Um, okay, something else that falls into this category is language. You have the opportunity to choose the titles and the words you want. You are not simply a cancer patient. No one is. You are a person dealing with cancer. Emphasis on person. Each person impacted by cancer has their own story, their own challenges, their own health history, and more. And each of those factors makes you unique a unique person impacted by cancer. I would actually argue that cancer patient, I, you know, I don't know if it's dehumanizing, but it's just not who you are. It's just one small part of your identity. So the, and so much of the terminology we use in the oncology space to me feel, can feel disrespectful. You know, we speak, uh, when someone passes, we speak of someone losing their battle. You know, I'm sure that you've all heard um, people make comments or, or if you've read something about, you know, there's actually a poem out there. Don't, don't say that I lost my battle. I don't want to be called a loser at my funeral. There's a poem about that or something like that. People, um, people, and although this doesn't necessarily trickle down to patients, but very often in, you know, in um, um, meetings and, and, and things like that, people whose treatment were not effect, was not effective failed therapy. Those taking advantage of clinical trials are subjects. And while we personally may not be able to change the language used overall, because it starts in a scientific place, we can demand that respectful terms respectful terms can be to be used around us. Outside of the clinical tags you receive, how do you want to be known? Someone in treatment, a survivor, a thriver, a co-survivor. I've even heard somebody who called themselves an aliver. It's the only per I've only heard one person do that, but I, I did. In other words, you can choose what you want to be called. Um, and that that subtly guides, those choices subtly guide our identity and self-determination, which leads to the next thing, which is about self-determination. But I'm seeing some stuff in the chat about war and like the war against cancer. Uh, some of us never want to be in war. It's right. Alive is brilliant. I'm glad that you like it. Um, you know, I actually, um, was in a session at a, an oncology conference about language and cancer. And do you know that while some people really, it resonates to hear, you know, they're fighting for their lives, they're in a war against, or a battle against cancer, that the studies show that people who use that, and I don't know if it's still accurate, this was at least five years ago, they don't do as well medically. Um, 
it's just something to think about, but I know that I don't use that terminology anymore with myself or with anybody. Um, you know, for instance, we happen to have a program that helps women deal with the cosmetic side effects of treatment. And the way I talked about it always was for, it's for women battling the, co the cosmetic side effects of treatment. I never say that anymore. And I feel really strongly about it. You're right. It's, it's, um, it's, a personal decision and for people who uh, it empowers, that's great, but we don't make those assumptions anymore that it's an empowering term. Okay, now we're talking about self-determination and that's another way to maintain dignity, to determine what our needs are and to prioritize them. These decisions are very personal and different for each person. Whatever the decisions each of us make, taking control where we are able reminds us in a very practical way that we are more than a cancer diagnosis. And that assists us in maintaining our dignity in what can admittedly be an undignified experience. Examples of how we present ourselves, examples of this are how we present ourselves physically, being kind to ourselves and maintaining a continued sense of purpose. So let's begin with the most basic, how we present ourselves and how we ensure we are comfortable with the way we look. There will be changes, no doubt, but if we do our best to present ourselves in a way that makes us happy, or at least makes us comfortable, our confidence grows, you know, that whole fake it till you make it thing. That may mean purchasing a wig or fun head wraps. It may mean not doing that and hennaing the scalp or just going, you know, as is. Uh, it may mean completing breast construction or removing implants. The point is that it could be any number of things. It may mean finding clothes that make us feel good and cover our body change as well. Or it may mean finding lingerie that makes us feel sexy and displaying our bodies, our changed bodies. The most important thing is to find what makes you feel comfortable given the situation. It means finding ways to address some of the other cosmetic or physical side effects that cancer or treatment can bring. Dealing with skin tone, changes to nails, similar things. It may seem that these things are almost too frivolous to address. And I want to talk about that for just a second, because so often people call and they are so embarrassed that they're looking for a solution, that their nails are peeling or they're falling off or whatever it is. They can't believe that this is what they're concerned about. Um, but it's not frivolous. These things help us feel like us. I know women, and I'm sure Rachel does too, who have wanted to train excuse me, change treatment protocols because they were terrified of losing their hair. These things help us identify as who we are and the psychosocial impact of them is great. So you should never feel like something is too frivolous to address in the face of cancer. Um, if it, like I said, if it helps to, it, you to feel like you, it will, and if it helps you feel more like you, excuse me, the changes to your sense of self will positively impact your overall attitude, which as I mentioned before, can actually impact physical outcomes. One of the other things I mentioned, maintaining a sense of a continued sense of purpose is so important. Your sense of purpose is a significant part of your identity. It, it's what makes you you. It's what gives your life meaning. What are your priorities in life outside of, of course, successfully treating, uh, completing treatment? Are you committed to a cause? Is your family your be all and end all? Are you an artist that needs to create? Whatever it is, there, there's likely a way you can still be doing some of this. Of course, individual goals may change during and after a cancer experience, but your overall priorities can remain the same. Maybe you've always volunteered in the community, and perhaps now you'd like to help other people who are facing cancer. If your family is a priority, spend time with them. <clears throat> you may not be able to do the same things you did before while you're in active treatment, but there are other things for sure. 
watch a movie with your partner, teach your children how to make a delicious meal, read to them, or on a day you're tired, have them read to you. Depending on where you are in your cancer experience, perhaps you wanna create a legacy to pass on to children, grandchildren, uh, family members. You can be sure people remember what's important to you and know what's important to you through conversations, videos, journaling. Of course, the things we discussed today are just a handful of the ways to maintain dignity and feel positive about ourselves during the cancer experience. But they all lead back to the same idea of remembering that we are more than our diagnosis. We are people who have been impacted by cancer, not cancer patients. Dignity is a basic human right. Honor, respect, esteem are all parts of dignity. Self-determination is as well. The loss of dignity is distressing and demoralizing. And as we all know, the cancer experience can include, as I said, some pretty undignified elements. So we may need to reframe our experiences, which I won't pretend is easy. We may need to adjust some of our goals, which can be painful, but those things can also be empowering. And when we feel empowered, we are ready to meet what comes next in our experience with strength, strength of knowing that we, the essence of who we are has not changed. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, that emotional, that psychological, that spiritual strength does impact our physical outcomes. It may just give us that edge, but either way, our lives will improve. Improve because we will be living with meaning, living with a sense of purpose, and living with a clear sense of who we are as individuals. Earlier on, I mentioned that, there are th that the things we focus on today are just some of the many behaviors that allow us a sense of control. Another thing to keep in mind is to protect our emotional health, be kind to ourselves. Yes, some things changed and may continue to change. So cut yourself some slack. It takes time to adjust to each and every change and that's okay. And please accept help when offered reach out for help. As Dr. Cohen said, reach out for help, uh, even if you don't know what you need. I want to remind you that woman to woman and Sharsharet, we're here for you and your loved ones during this time. I am happy to speak about some of the resources, all free, that Sharsharet offers to bolster emotional health during the cancer experience. But for, first, I saw a lot of things going on in the chat, and I wanna see if there are any questions. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute and go ahead and ask. Somebody said, priorities may remain sa the same, but your ability to undertake in any way can create frustration and a sense of loss. Absolutely 100% true, which is why I encourage you to maintain your sense of priorities. And although it may be frustrating to find ways, different ways to engage in those priorities, it's often possible. Um, and your ability to continue, right. Your ability, inability. Oh, so she says, so maybe it's the inability to continue that's frustrating. Yeah, I, I totally hear that. And the way that you continue, can be frustrating and provide or, 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 or cause a real sense of loss. But in many, many cases, there's a way around that. It may not feel as, as, um, as meaningful or comforting um, or engaging at first, but I, I think as it, time goes on, you begin to appreciate that it's, it's continuing to connect you to your priorities and you'll work your way back to, to doing the other specific activities. But you're right, you're right, there's a loss, there's a, there is a loss. And so by reframing emotionally, re reframing physically in what we do, it's a way to ameliorate the loss. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts they want to share? Oh, how do you deal with post-treatment trauma that occurs when you experience life-altering side effects and nobody really cares? 
Okay, so I mean, that's that's a totally fair question. Um, but let me just clarify that when you say nobody, that doesn't, hopefully that doesn't include your healthcare team, right? So, so uh, and, and the other part, the people around you, I will address because that's an important thing to address. But if you have concerns, oh, I'm still working on that, on, on responding, talking, ah, hopefully that does not include your healthcare team. They should, they should appreciate all of your concerns, your ongoing side effects. If they're not, please seek a second opinion. But what's more common is once this is done, once we're out of active treatment, people around us expect us to be all better with a snap of a finger, right? You walk out of your last chemo and people think, oh, it's over. Thank God she's back to who she was. And we know that's not the case. We know it, right? We may even be looking better, right? Feeling stronger, but our insides aren't necessarily matching our outsides. We have just gone through significant trauma and it takes a long time, again, in all ways, physically, emotionally, spiritually, to get back to the person we were, or at least get back to a comfortable equilibrium. And it's hard for people around us to realize that support drops off. Uh, people ask how you're doing less and less. People aren't checking in with you, bringing meals, offering you, you know, play dates for your children or whatever it is. And what's worse, when you share a fear, someone might actually change the subject because, and, and I want to just point out that by and large, people are doing that because they care about you, because they love you, and they're so glad this is over, and they need to believe this is over, and they want you to be well. So know that in most cases, it comes from a place of love and caring. That doesn't necessarily help us, though. I would say... Okay, so for some Oh, sorry, I was just going to mention that this is actually a theme that we've been hearing a lot in different groups. And in response to that, um, Woman to Woman recently started a group specifically for long-term survivors. Um, and again, your population is certainly welcome. This is long-term gynecologic cancer survivors. But again, the fact that these issues persist and what's really interesting <laughs> what's been really interesting for us is seeing who has been attending that group because we have our regular people who attend groups and familiar names and what's really interesting is when we blast everything out you never know who's going to show up and there are patients who have been out of treatment for 5 10 15 years who are coming to that group and i think it shows that cancer truly is a chronic disease whether you're out of treatment or not and again in that group we have been discussing both the physical and psychological long-term effects of being a cancer whatever survivor thriver alive or whatever language you want to use so again if any of you are gynecologic cancer long-term survivors we do welcome you to attend that I, I love that. I love that idea. Um, a very practical suggestion, in addition to joining a group specifically for that, which is fabulous, is to choose the people you want to address this with. Not everybody's capable of doing it, but if you have one or two people who are willing to listen when you say, I know that the worst of this seems over and, and maybe is over, but I need you to know that I'm still struggling. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with fear that I'll have a recurrence or I'm struggling with neuropathy and my, my ability to, to move the way I was or whatever it, it is. If you have one or two people that you can have that very honest conversation with, then can, can count yourself fortunate. That, that is amazing. And if you feel like you don't, talk to someone. Paula Sharsheret, uh, social worker, talk to someone, one of the social workers at Woman to Woman, um, because it's not something you should bury. It is absolutely not something you should bury. It's valid, it's real, and it needs to be addressed. It was a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. Anybody else have any thoughts or questions they want to share? One thing I really liked that you mentioned um, 
when you were talking about choices, as it's something we speak about a lot, is actually control. And I think that, you know, as you all can relate to, when you're given a cancer diagnosis, so much is taken out of your control. And I, I thought it was really interesting when you were also speaking about how you choose to present yourself, whether you choose to do reconstruction or not, how you choose to um, deal with hair loss, you know, all of those are choices in a situation where so much, and I think that really relates to dignity, you know, as a, as a grown up, we are told we have choices. You know, when you're a little kid, you have to do what, what mom or dad say, but when you're a grown up, you sort of assume, okay, I'm going to choose how I spend my time and who I spend it with and what I eat and what my hobbies are. Um, but all of a sudden, a lot of those choices are taken away from you um, in terms of how you look, in terms of how you spend your time, in terms of how you eat, because sometimes, you know, your favorite food is not appealing to you anymore and you need to eat things that are palatable. Um, and, and it's just interesting. I don't know if that resonates at all with anyone, that idea of control, but that is also something we see quite a lot or hear quite a lot as a theme in our various groups that we have, whether it's patients going through treatment or um, who have already um, finished treatment. I see that Julie has um, something. Getting so it now. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, th uh, that's so interesting. This oral maintenance that many, uh, many survivors are dealing with. You know, when that came up for me, what well, like a trigger was when we when when COVID vaccines first came out and the people they were prioritized, you know, until the general population gave them. And I'm on I'm I think in my seventh year of oral maintenance right now with three more to go am I in cancer treatment? Does that put me at a, a, you know, at the top of the list or toward the top of the list? That was a, and, and my, my oncologist said, yes. So you're exactly right, uh, Julie, that yes, we still are in treatment. And those, those oral maintenance drugs have physical impacts and emotional impacts as well. Um, again, I think it goes right back to people want to assume that you're well because they love you, um, and you know you can you can say you can be honest with people. Say, yeah, thank goodness the worst of the treatment is over. But remember, I'm still doing this, and and you know because of that, I have this, that, and the other. And you know, thank goodness it's not as intense as reaction to chemotherapy, but it's a, a daily reminder for me. Um, and, you know, people don't, they love and want us to be well. Plus, if you've not been through cancer, it is so hard to understand that there is this trauma there that is on some levels chronic. You know, I am 25 years out of one cancer and eight years out of another. And I am rarely somebody who's triggered, maybe because I've like, dived headfirst into it and I'm always talking about it but a couple of months ago I had a tiny little nothing removed from my face and I opened my eyes and there were three people stand I was lying down there were three people standing in front of me there was a huge light on me and all of a sudden I'm back in you know waking up from anesthesia and like it so shocked me because I don't but these this, these traumas don't, don't go away. They're there under the surface. And, and I think the people closest to us need to understand that on some level, even if, even if they're not someone you routinely go to, to talk to, they still need to have a basic understanding that something might come up at any time. Yeah. Okay. Um, Listen, I, um, we're going to have a recording of this. It will, um, I know that Rachel will send it out. It's going to be on our website. I'm going to put in the chat box my email address should anybody have any questions, either about this presentation or about what Char Sherrod offers. But just very, very quickly, thank you for that. Very, very quickly, I just want to remind you that all of the resources Char Sherrod offers are free, customized, and 100% private. Whether it's speaking to a social worker to, to um, be connected to resources, to vent a particular day, 
or it's getting a kit for families who are raising young children while going through cancer or our survivorship kit or our makeup kit that is meant for women who are facing cosmetic side effects. It's all free, it's all available. And, and you shouldn't hesitate to reach out either through our website or I can connect you and you now have my email address. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us. Yeah. I just Thank wanted you. to say also as a follow-up to that, that Woman to Woman, as we mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, has a similar mission. And one thing that we do offer, which I, I know that I think that you have a version of also, is the one-on-one -on -one peer mentoring. And that's not just for women in active treatments. That is for women at any stage of your cancer journey, because we have you know, volunteers who are much closer to the end of their treatment, who are on ongoing maintenance and will be forever, or women who are, you know, many, many years, decades even out. And I, I remember, you know, I, I, many years ago, I was working late and I was sitting in my office. It was about 7, 7.30 at night. I was trying to wrap up some stuff. And um, all of a sudden my phone rang and I picked it up and there was a woman and she said, I know this is crazy. I was given your card seven years ago, and I've kept it in my wallet for seven years. And she said, but tonight I felt like I needed to reach out. And she was having a tough, a tough weekend. She uh, was, had to stay home and her partner was away and she was alone and whatever it was, it was just hitting her. So I think going back to that, you know, that at any stage you might want to talk to someone. And again, you can reach out to Melissa, you can reach out to me. We refer to each other, you know, again, right. You know, we, we um, are lucky that we have so many resources within the cancer community that we can refer people to and we're not proprietary in any way. You know, we believe in getting people help wherever they, they possibly can. And again, that one-on-one -on -one mentorship is something we have uh, over 30 mentors, all different diagnoses, ages, psychosocial situations, um, places in their journey. And we would love to connect you with any of them at any point, so. Thank you so much to you, Rachel, and to the Woman to Woman program for your continued partnership. It's one that we treasure. And we do too. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Melissa. You know, I always learn so much from hearing you speak. You are wise and you share your experience in such an accessible way. And I think you should have your own talk show because you really have amazing <laughs> stage presence. So um, my next career, <laughs> a big screen. So um, thank you all so much. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Please reach out to either Melissa or to me or to my partner, Jillian um, Levinson, who is, um, you know, my partner in crime at Woman to Woman. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.